Good day, friends. I have a question for you. When last did you look at the prophetic clock? Time is running out fast. Matthew 24 tells us to take notice of the signs just before Jesus comes back again to fetch his children. Francois will show us now just how precisely the prophetic words of Christ were fulfilled in Matthew 24. Listen carefully. You are looking at tourists on their way to one of the caves near the Dead Sea called Kirbet Qumran. You know, people like new discoveries. Just look at this beautiful scene. You know, rain has got a way of beautifying nature. One of the greatest discoveries in scripture is the discovery of Jesus Christ in different characters and illustrations. I thought of how Christ appeared as an ordinary man to Abram when I visited the site of the Oak of Mamre here at Hebron. As a prophet, Jesus came to reveal to us the character of his Father, and what a revelation. After his ascension, Jesus became our High Priest. Right now, he intercedes on behalf of every repentant sinner. And one of these days, Jesus will return as King of Kings to restore the ruins caused by sin. I'm looking forward to that day. You are looking at a model of the temple from the time of Christ. During this lecture, we are going to listen to some of his prophecies concerning the temple and Jerusalem. We are also going to study certain predictions Jesus made concerning our day. It's very interesting. Let's read from Matthew 24 verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came to him to call his attention to its buildings. The temple, built by Herod the Great and his successors, was regarded as one of the seven wonders of antiquity. We are told that whenever the sun shone on the gold and marble of the temple, the reflection had an almost blinding effect on one's eyes. Jesus reacted in a very calm and courteous manner to the disciples' enchantment with the beauty of the temple. Matthew 24 verse 2 Do you see all these things? he asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Jesus and his puzzled disciples left the temple and went to the Mount of Olives. After a while they asked him for more detail. Verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They wanted to know more about the destruction of the temple and the signs of his second coming. Verses 4 and 5, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that there were numerous deceivers and impostors, as he calls them. They preyed on the people's hopes and fears and fermented revolution against Rome. One of these false messiahs, an Egyptian, invited the Jews to his desert outpost. Thousands responded, believing him to be the messiah who would deliver them from the Romans. Well, the Romans killed them all, but the false messiah escaped. If only the Jews had heeded Jesus' prophecy concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, many lives would have been spared. Let's learn from their mistakes. Acts chapter 21, 38 tells us that at a later stage, a Roman officer mistook the apostle Paul for this same Egyptian. Jesus warned about false Christs appearing before the destruction of Jerusalem. He also warned about false Christs appearing in these last days just before his second coming. Verses 24 to 26 For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the desert, do not go out. Or here he is, in the inner rooms, do not believe it. You're looking at people bringing honor to Karl Marx, the author of communism. Many regarded him as a messiah who would lead them to a communist heaven. Unfortunately, they were led to a hell of poverty. 
This is a Russian mother in Berlin weeping over the loss of a son. He followed a false prophet and then he died. Jim Jones and Koresh, Karl Marx and others, led many people to their graves. As we near the end of time, you will see and hear more and more of these false prophets. Just as the disciples of old, we too need to ask Jesus about the signs that will appear just before his second coming. Verses 6 to 8. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pangs. History tells us that the first major war broke out in Mauritania in 41 AD, just as Jesus predicted. The next war broke out in Britain and lasted from 43 to 61 AD. You're looking at the remains of an ancient Roman wall in St. Albans. Jesus predicted the first great war in Britain and historians confirm it. Josephus, the historian, tells us that after AD 62, Palestine was engulfed in guerrilla and terrorist activities which started in Galilee. We are told that the area became a scene of fire and blood. Thirty years previous to this bloodshed, Jesus spoke these words in Galilee. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. The Jewish nation rejected their advice and reaped a war. Besides predicting wars, Jesus also predicted terrible famines. In the reign of Emperor Claudius alone, 41 to 54, four major famines are recorded. One of them is mentioned in Acts chapter 11 verse 28. When I study the Bible in the light of history, my admiration for this inspired book just grows and grows. Listen to the next prediction by the prophet of prophets. Verse 9, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Paul, who was imprisoned at Caesarea, was but one of the thousands. Jesus predicted something that not only applied to the destruction of Jerusalem, but also to us living at the end of time. When we get to study the book of Revelation, you will see how everything that Daniel and Jesus spoke ties in with what John the Revelator saw. Verse 15, So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. We know what desolation means, but what does abomination mean? Luke 21 verse 20 supplies the answer. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Can you still remember from the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2 which empire ruled the world when Christ was on earth? But why is destructive Rome also called an abomination? In our studies from the book of Daniel we discovered that they worshipped the emperor. This is abominable. And this arch of Constantine reminds us of the fact that they forced upon the world a false day of worship in 321 AD. This too is an abomination. The Pantheon, temple of many gods, reminds us of the fact that the Romans had a sacerdotal system. In other words, a priesthood where priests were given supernatural powers. The Bible calls this an abomination. I've discovered something very interesting in the Vatican Museum. Let's quickly go there and look at it. The Greeks called this image Artemis, the Romans called her Diana. She was worshipped as the main goddess in the pantheon of Roman goddesses. 2 Kings 23 verse 13 and Isaiah 44 19 call idol worship an abomination. In other words, abomination is a false religion. But does the term abomination that causes desolation only apply to heathen Rome? In our study of the little horn of Daniel 9, we discovered that it represents both pagan and papal Rome. 
So when Jesus warned about the abomination that would desolate Jerusalem, he also had papal Rome in mind. In other words, when Jesus refers to pagan Rome who persecuted God's people and destroyed little Jerusalem, he speaks of a type. And who do you think is the antitype? Well, Papal Rome, which is also an abominable system, a false religion who persecutes spiritual Jerusalem, God's people. In his book on the popes, Christopher Hibbard has a picture of the Pontiff's Crozier or Krukov office. I was interested in the caption which says that this Renaissance flourish, this ornament of flowing curves, unites pagan antiquity with Christianity. Daniel 9 sees the little horned Rome as a combination of both pagan and papal. You're looking at a prophetic fulfillment. Like the emperors of old, the Pope also possesses ecclesiastical as well as secular powers. The more you study the words of Jesus, the more you see the double application of pagan and papal Rome. Let's read again what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 24:15. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. When did Roman armies besiege Jerusalem as Jesus predicted? Historians tell us that Cestius Gallus arrived at Jerusalem in October 66 AD. At first he destroyed a section of the mighty wall that protected the city. As soon as he entered the city, the soldiers fled into the confines of the temple. They felt safe behind those huge, strong walls. Josephus tells us that for no reason whatsoever, he suddenly withdrew from the city and headed back to his base at Antioch. But his decision was disastrous for his troops. Jewish resistance fighters manned the ridges above the northbound mountain road. And with arrows, spears and rocks, they succeeded in killing almost 6,000 Romans. With all the Romans gone and with most of the Jewish fighters pursuing them, the Christians could make a quick escape from Jerusalem. Why? Well, they heeded the prophecy of Jesus. Matthew 24, 15 to 20. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of his house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. Why not in the winter and why not on the Sabbath? Everything that Jesus said was important. And remember, Jesus is also speaking to us who live at the end of time. We too will have to flee from the coming persecution of Rome, the abomination that desolates. Professor Yadin and his archaeological team excavated and reconstructed this ancient synagogue on top of Masada. The early Christians worshipped on the Sabbath and Jesus wanted them to continue keeping holy his special day, even under emergency circumstances. Why? Because it is the symbol of rest in his completed work on Calvary. Since AD 31 to AD 66, the early Christians who lived here in Jerusalem prayed, Lord, help us to discern the signs of the times. And when we see the Roman armies besiege our city, show us what to do. And Lord, please prevent us from fleeing in the winter or on your holy Sabbath. History affirms that God answered their prayers. They fled Jerusalem in November, just before winter, and it happened on a Wednesday. They founded a colony at Pella, southeast of the Sea of Galilee. Not one of those early Christians who accepted the prophetic word of Jesus died. This event is going to be repeated. I had the privilege of visiting this very important archaeological site in Jordan. This is where the Christians who fled Jerusalem lived for almost four centuries. And the latest excavations tell us that as long as the Christian colony existed, 
they kept the Sabbath as Jesus taught them. One does quite a bit of thinking when visiting these sites. The Christians who lived here escaped the terrible destruction of Jerusalem because they read and obeyed the prophecies of Jesus and the prophecies of Daniel. While we are looking at Pella, let's learn lessons from its history. If we want to escape the coming destruction of this planet, we better heed and obey the prophecies of Jesus and the prophet Daniel. The prophecies of Daniel and Revelation tell us that the second coming of Jesus is nearer than we realize. He wants you and me to be ready when he comes to take his children home. If we ignore the prophecies, we will eventually perish like the disobedient Jews perished in the year AD 70. Let me tell you what happened. It was springtime in the year 70 AD. Thousands of Jews flocked to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover. Suddenly the city was surrounded by the Romans who came to take revenge after their humiliating defeat of AD 66. The Latin writing on this arch in Rome tells us that Titus besieged the city after the Jews were gathered inside. As the siege progressed, disease, filth and famine took their grisly toll. Amid the mounting panic, three gang-like organizations added to the horror by terrorizing their fellow Jews and competing viciously for control of the dwindling food supplies. While this Israeli guide tells of the cruelties committed against the Jews in Belsen, Germany, I thought of something which Josephus recorded. He said that during the siege, mothers even ate their own babies. Mothers, do you think it's possible to take that dear little one of yours, your own flesh, and eat it? If only the mothers of Jerusalem had listened to the words of Jesus, this would never have happened to them. He knew Jerusalem was going to be besieged. He wanted to save them from doing such a dreadful thing. But they rejected his warnings and paid a terrible price. May God help us to pay serious attention to his prophetic word. The beautiful temple complex was burned down and razed to the ground. And this was in spite of strict orders from Titus who wanted to save the most beautiful building of antiquity for generations to come. But his orders were disobeyed and the temple was set alight. Jesus predicted in Matthew 24 verse 2 that not one stone would be left upon another. Every one would be thrown down. In their search for molten gold, the Roman soldiers overturned every single stone. You are looking at a group of archaeologists excavating at the present-day wall in Jerusalem. The Turkish Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, built it in 1542. Do you notice the little slit indentation on the edge of some of the huge stones? They date from the time of Christ. Suleiman used these very same stones in the reconstruction of the present wall. You're looking at a fulfillment of prophecy. All that is left of the original Jerusalem from the time of Christ is this piece of wall which was part of the outer court of the temple. For understandable reasons, this is the most sacred and the most precious place for the Jews in the entire world. 250,000 Jews perished in Jerusalem in AD 70. After the Romans captured the beloved city, they sacrificed pigs on the temple site to show their contempt for the Jews. And while they were doing it, they also worshipped their heathen Roman banners. The Roman army, the abomination that causes desolation, literally fulfilled the prophecy of Jesus. 97,000 men, women and children were taken prisoner. Many others were sent to Egypt as slaves till their death. When Jesus wept over Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, he saw the terrible fate of the Jewish nation. He wanted to save them, but they rejected his salvation and reaped a harvest of ever-flowing tears. Some were offered for sale as slaves to Gentiles living in Judea. They went for a trifling sum per head, owing to the glut of the market and the dearth of purchases. Many of the unfortunate, 
prophecy rejecting disobedient Jews were sent to Greece to dig this Corinthian canal. It's quite an experience to visit these places and think back of what Jesus prophesied on the Mount of Olives so long ago. The Jews who dug here are all dead, but the canal testifies of the truth of the Bible prophecy. Every time I visit the Arch of Titus and I look at this relief, I realize that we do have a sure word of prophecy. You are looking at Jewish prisoners on their way to Rome after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Jesus wanted to prevent this trauma, but they did not heed his urgent appeal to repent. Did you know that Moses also predicted the sad results of disobedience? Deuteronomy 28.15 says, However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come upon you. They will lay siege to all the cities throughout your land until the high fortified walls in which you trust fall down. Verse 52 A friend of mine looks at the fulfillment of this prophecy at the ancient site of Lachish. Because of the suffering that your enemy will inflict on you during the siege, you will eat the fruit of the womb, the flesh of the sons and daughters. The Lord your God has given you. Verse 53. On top of this ancient tell at Lachish, as well as at Jerusalem and other places, starving fathers and mothers ate their children. Why? They ignored the prophetic warnings of Jesus. And the very same cruelty also occurred here at the ancient capital of Samaria. I'm so glad Jesus speaks so clearly and so kindly to us, warning us. He does not confuse people with multiple choices. We only have to choose between obedience and disobedience, between tradition and truth. Come with me to a very important archaeological site at Nablus. Anciently, this was called Shechem. This used to be the temple where the Samaritans worshipped in the days of Christ. The mountain on which it is situated is called Gerizim, the Mount of Blessings. 3,500 years ago, when Joshua entered the Promised Land, the Lord told them to meet right here. Six tribes gathered on the slopes of Mount Ebal, the Mount of Curses. And as you can see, it's very barren. The other six tribes met on Gerasim, the Mount of Blessings. Do you notice the blessings of vegetation? I marveled when I saw this. If you have a minute to spare, please read the account in Deuteronomy chapter 28. God told his people exactly what blessings they would enjoy should they obey and what curses they would experience should they disobey. The choice was theirs. God's law is not designed to punish us, but to protect and bless us. He does not ask us to keep his law in order to be saved, as some people think. No, the law is only given for people who are redeemed, people who love the Lord. Obedience is the means whereby we develop a friendship with the Lord. Jesus says in John fourteen fifteen, If you love me, you will obey what I command. When I stood at this historical site, my thoughts went back to what transpired here so many centuries ago. If the Jewish nation obeyed God's commandments of love spoken here, their history would not have been written in tears. I asked the Lord to help me to always allow him to soften my heart and make me submissive and obedient. In this lecture we have looked at the historical event that occurred in AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman armies. What Jesus told those early disciples, he is also telling us, Rome would again persecute God's people and we should be intelligent enough to read the signs of the times. They tell us that the second coming of Jesus is nearer than ever before. When we study the prophetic word, we discover where we are in the stream of time. It's later than we think. It is time for us to wake up from our slumber and get ready for the second coming of Jesus. Luke 21 verse 25 and 26 
And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. Jesus, the greatest of all prophets, refers to the long time of papal persecution that lasted for 1,260 years. And then he predicted certain celestial signs that would announce the nearness of his coming. In our next lecture, we will hear more about the mysterious dark day of May 19, 1780. Even up to this time, astronomers cannot explain this strange phenomenon. But Jesus also predicted the greatest meteoric shower in history. On November 13, 1833, the skies were ablaze with this great celestial sign, telling the world that Jesus was coming soon. But these celestial signs are of such a great importance that they are repeated in the book of Revelation under the fifth and sixth seals. If one looks at the prophetic watch, you discover that time for this planet has run out. There is just a few seconds left for you and me to ask God to make us loving and lovable Christians. Dear friends, I urge you to start a lasting relationship with Jesus. Please pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for the time of grace we live in. You have given us early warnings and signs to show us when you will return. Help us not to postpone but to surrender our lives to you while there is still time. In Jesus' name, Amen. Don't miss the part two of this very interesting subject.